on the road. Still on the road. Still on the road. Fur- further down the road. Further down the road with NG2. That I went was... on the river to NG2. Yeah. Well, you know, um, uh, you know, on the entrance ramp, <laughs> getting on the road. No. Uh, <laughs> Finding your car keys. <laughs> Oops, I lost my keys. <laughs> How about going off the rails on the NG train? <laughs> That'll really confuse them because they think we're talking about a different technology. Going off the rails on an NG train. <laughs> wow. This episode is sponsored by Hired.com. Every week on Hired, they run an auction where over a thousand tech companies in San Francisco, New York, and LA bid on JavaScript developers, providing them with the salary and equity up front. The average JavaScript developer gets an average of 5 to 15 introductory offers and an average salary of over $130,000 a year. Users can either accept an offer and go right into interviewing with the company or deny them without any continuing obligations. It's totally free for users, and when you're hired, they also give you a $2,000 signing bonus as a thank you for using them. But if you use the Adventures in Angular link, you'll get a $4,000 bonus instead. Finally, if you're not looking for a job but know someone who is, you can refer them to Hired and get a $1,337 bonus if they accept a job. Go sign up at Hired.com slash Adventures in Angular. Ready to master Angular? Oasis Digital offers Angular Bootcamp, a three-day in-person workshop class for individuals or teams. Bring us to your site or send developers to our classes in St. Louis or San Francisco, angularbootcamp.com. This episode is sponsored by Widgmo 5, a brand new generation of JavaScript controls. A pretty amazing line of HTML5 and JavaScript products for enterprise application development in that Widgmo 5 leverages ECMAScript 5 and each control ships with AngularJS directives. Check out the faster, lighter, and more mobile Widgmo 5. This episode is sponsored by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean is the provider I use to host all of my creations. All the shows are hosted there along with any other projects I come up with. Their user interface is simple and easy to use, their support is excellent, and their VPSs are backed on solid state drives and are fast and responsive. Check them out at digitalocean.com. If you use the code Angular Adventures, you'll get a $10 credit. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 60 of Adventures in Angular. My name is Joe Eames. I'll be your host today. Chuck is out. And we have on our panel the illustrious Ward Bell. Hello. Lucas Rubuki. Hello. Also equally illustrious. Thank you. And just slightly more illustrious, John Papa. Hey. So today we are going to be talking about Angular 2. Uh, a few weeks ago, we had an episode called The Road to Angular 2. And we kind of ended that talk that we were going to be doing more work with Angular 2 over the coming weeks and months. And we're sort of circling back around. And that's going to be our topic today is... What have we been doing with Angular 2? What's it like? It's still on alpha right now. Our experiences with it, where it's headed, our thoughts and impressions. So let's get started. So we last talked, uh, it was several weeks ago, but it was a lot of fun. We've all been doing different things with Angular. Uh, Maybe we can kind of talk about kind of what those different things are. I know from my perspective, at the time when we did that podcast, I was doing a lot of work in TypeScript and ES6 with Babel uh, and System.js and just trying to get those things working around Angular because it was early alphas and I was just trying to figure out, okay, if it's early alpha, I'm going to go ahead and make sure all the other pieces that I need to use are in place. But since then, I've been doing quite a bit of uh, Angular 2 coding too, uh, writing little simple and demo apps. Uh, what have you guys been up to? Ward? Well, I'm right there with John. I have been spending some serious time with the Angular 2 alphas. And with a particular focus on how to unit test something. And so I'm in there, and I'm ready to ta- kind of talk about where things are and where things are headed and what you should do about it. Have you actually gotten unit testing going then, Ward? I have, as a matter of fact. It doesn't sound like many, <laughs> but I have over 40 tests. Uh, <laughs> and because what I'm trying to do is figure out how to test the range of things that you would do in a normal app. And so I've been well, learning each of the different areas, functional feature areas of Angular 2 and learning how to test each of them. So it's not really about a test coverage of a deep app. It's about like, okay, how would I test a service? How would I test a component? How would I test this? And how would I test that? Awesome. We'll definitely have to circle back and talk more about that. Uh, how about you, Lucas? 
So I have been admittedly a bit scared of kind of the transient state of the alpha release. And so I've been uh, focusing on ES6 and wrapping my mind around that, as well as using you know Gulp, using Webpack, and writing my 1.x apps in kind of a ES6 style, which then I believe will translate over well to Angular 2, as well as kind of being a community person, I am working actually with Jeff Cross and uh, Patrick Stapleton and Dan Moline. They're coming out and we're doing an Angular 2 hackathon in Phoenix. And so as well as trying to get good resources out, you know, via hackathons and, and feedback. So that is kind of where my really focus is, is like, how do I get good content out to the masses as well as good feedback to the Angular team? Gotcha. I've been doing a bit of speaking about Angular 2. Spoke at that conference. I did a webinar for Pluralsight and building demos kind of oriented around that. As a Pluralsight author, I'm always interested in new topics to author on. So that's been my experience with working with Angular 2 is uh, mostly just in the demo and speaking about phase, talking about it. I did give a really fun talk about Angular 1 and Angular 2 directives a couple months ago at a conference, which I really enjoyed giving. Uh, that was at Angular U. Ward Bell's conference. Hey, it was Peter Kellner's, but I was there. <laughs> Helping from the wings, right? Yeah, that's it. That's kind of what I do. So that was interesting at uh, Angular U. I remember Dan and I did a session on kind of getting ready for it and kind of things you can start doing. And at the time, I mean, gosh, this was four months ago now, uh, we were building an app with Angular 2 with ES6 and TypeScript. And there were definitely some differences between building it with those two technologies that kind of struck me as I went through it. And it was actually, I, I felt at the time, it was easier for me to build it with ES6 than it was TypeScript. And for me, I don't know about you guys, but that has completely flipped for me. I've, I've been writing apps with TypeScript with Angular 2 for weeks now, and it feels much more comfortable in TypeScript than it does in ES6 for me. Uh, and maybe it's because, I know them both equally well, but but maybe it's because the tooling is what I'm kind of thinking, is the tooling's helping me catch stupid little things that I'm doing since it has more information. Mm. And that matters because right now there are a lot of things that all have to be lined up, and it seems like you're saying the same thing a couple of different ways as you're connecting all, you're wiring up the dots, and the tooling can really help you there. For example, if I import a foo, and then I go use a foo someplace else, it's pretty helpful when the tooling tells you that you didn't spell foo correctly, which I'm quite capable of doing. So out of curiosity, John, what ID are you using to get that? Is it Visual Studio Code? Or I'd love to hear kind of your tool chain for that. Yeah, I've used a couple with it uh, over the last couple of months. I've used Atom VS Code, uh, Visual Studio Code, and I've used uh, WebStorm as well. And I'm back on Visual Studio Code for writing Angular 2 uh, because of the power of the different features that they're adding in there. So VS Code is actually built on top of TypeScript, which is one of the reasons why it's got such great TypeScript tooling built into it. So it's it's right on top there. I did not know that. Yeah, it's, it's pretty impressive how they do this. It's actually built with that. Uh, and what's nice is um, it's interesting. So there's we talked last time about how the different players are in this game. To use Angular 2, it's not just Angular, right? You've got to learn what tool are you going to use, what transpiler do you want to use, ES6 or TypeScript, or you could do ES5, although I don't know anybody who's doing that. Ward made fun of me last time doing a joke on that one. <laughs> Actually, yep. I wrote an ES5 sample. Hell, uh, good. You have Angular 2 with ES5. As a matter of fact, that's going to be one of the things we have to all know how to do because there are going to be people who want to right. say, I don't want to mess with this stuff. And the Angular team is adamant that people who don't want to move to TypeScript or ES6 or something like that should still be able to program in Angular 2. And so uh, I've been looking into how you would do that just a little. And at least I've got something going. Yeah, I think that the hard part has been, for me, at least this was a couple months ago when we did this for the other podcast, was after writing a couple samples for Angular U and some other things, I quickly realized that it's not just Angular. My struggles weren't with Angular 2, even though it's alpha and it's got its own little gaps because it's alpha. My struggles were with the things around it. It was with TypeScript still evolving to add some of the decorators at the time, which it now has. Uh, the tooling was catching up with things that's going to be coming down the road with ES6 and ES7 even. And then also the module loading story with System.js or JSPM or, or Webpack. And I feel like I've got a better handle on those things because I've kind of focused there for a bit. And then I circled back to Angular 2, which 
What's funny part was, is there were weeks where I'd go and I didn't write like any Angular 2. I was just writing, you know, TypeScript stuff or I was writing JSPM or System.js stuff, trying to get it to work. And now I'm back on the Angular 2 stuff and able to dive deep into what's happening there. But I think for people getting started, the lesson out of this might be, look, even if you're not familiar with Angular 2, you might, and you don't want to dump in right now, like Lucas has done, you might want to jump into some of these other things because they're all going to be equally valuable to know. And the important part here is Angular 2 isn't forcing any of this on you. You could use ES5. But if you're going to do JavaScript in 2015, 2016, and beyond, you really need to start learning ES6 or TypeScript or some one of these things. Right. I would even say just if you're not using a build system like Grunt or Gulp, then you really should implement that into your workflow as soon as possible. Just the advantages are staggering. And so this has actually been a good opportunity for me to even just uh, sharpen the saw on that as well. But I mean, I think any kind of you know modern web applications, like you have to be using a build system to to help out. And so that's I think a kind of an implied benefit of kind of moving in that direction. Yeah, I think a build system and a module system, right? Yeah. Because you have to have something to load these modules, and these modules in Angular two are not the modules that we're familiar with in Angular one, right? The modules in Angular one were more like namespaces. If you have a Java or a .NET background. And in Angular 2, they're traditional modules from the ES6 or what is it, ES2015 now? Syntax. So I have recently had an interesting experience with ES6. Even though, you know, there's reason to learn it because it's how we author Angular. Well, it's not how you author Angular 2, but that's what a lot of the demos, right now at least, are produced in. So there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in ES6. I always kind of felt like, Outside of just the module system and maybe the fat arrow that just had a lot of little kind of cool things, but they were little sort of niche features, even though I've actually done a course on ES6, and so I know it pretty well. But recently I was doing some work, and I saw that somebody was doing destructuring in ES6, and they, it was like kind of the back of their hand. So every time they were doing anything if that they could use destruction, they are using destructuring. And just watching them work, I was like, holy cow, this is actually really cool. And it's become my new favorite feature in ES6. So I think it's one of those so Joe, things So Joe, can that, I interrupt you? Can you explain yeah. the structuring to people who maybe haven't seen it? Because I agree, it's pretty wicked cool. Yeah, it's easy to go online and find these little tutorials that t- show you, oh, hey, if you have an array of two elements and you want to swap their place and the elements you use destructuring, which is you set up a var and you create multiple variables and then the variable names and then the equal sign and then you point it in an array, right? or at an object. And based on whether you're pointing at an array or an object, you're going to use on the left hand of the equal sign square brackets or curly brackets to match up. So if you're destructuring an array, use array brackets. And it's hard to describe over audio, but certainly look up a tutorial if you're interested. But it's a way to basically point at a more complex object, either an array or an object, and pull out just the pieces that you want and get variables that point at them. So the idea seems great, but until you see it in a useful scenario, you kind of are like, oh, that's cool. But once you start seeing it in useful scenarios, and I'm all the ES6 features are going to be like this. They seem cool. And then you start seeing a useful scenario. And especially if you can see it in a useful scenario where you yourself could use it frequently, then you start to see, wow, this is actually really cool. I'm going to start doing this a lot more now that I can see where this can benefit me. So in this case, it's a matter of, hey, if you've got a function that returns an object and that object may have five variables or three variables and you want to work with them, it's really easy to grab those three variables into their own variable names, you know, foo, bar, and baz, for example, and work with them. Or if you have a function that's returning 10 things and you only care about two of them, then it's easy to grab just those two and put them in variables really quickly. So that's kind of destructuring. Again, difficult to describe over audio. But it wasn't until I really saw somebody working with it sort of second nature that it really struck me as, wow, that's really cool. And the way I kind of look at that with modules is when you're you're importing it from a module even, which is a, is a form of that too, you're able to, mm-hmm. it's almost like you're able to reach into the module and grab just the piece you want by doing re- re- destructuring. Because then you're saying, hey, this module may actually expose seven things, but now I'm only grabbing the one I want. Or, uh, as you mentioned, you know, sometimes you've got like some kind of an object literal or some kind of a uh, class or whatever in ES6 or TypeScript, and you want to take that and you want to pull out just the properties you want into other variables. Uh, right. So there's, there's lots of great applications of that that just make coding easier, I think. Yeah, and so I'm kind of waiting for that experience with TypeScript. Been, you have the structuring in TypeScript. 
Oh, yeah, no, no, no. I'm saying I'm waiting for that experience of, oh, wow, that's really cool. Now I totally am excited about using it, right? Mm-hmm. I'm waiting for that experience working with TypeScript. You know, I watch tutorials of TypeScript. I see code in TypeScript, and I'm still waiting for that, oh, that's cool yeah. moment. Yeah, so the where I mean, I don't know whether it's cool because it's the thing that every other language has had. But the fact that you get in, in t- some kind of IntelliSense, the fact that you get some kind of typing support, the fact that you can do refactoring comfortably and say, oops, I want to rename foo to fuzz, or more challenging, you've got a variable called data and you want to do that and you don't want to do a global replace of the word data, you want to just change the variable whose name is data. And only with a TypeScript plus tooling do you get that. So Yeah, right. and autocomplete and filling auto things complete, in. Autocomplete and, and like all that stuff catching of the silly stuff that can really um, bog you down. That's the like, uh, okay, I'm glad to have that now. But the, the good other- news is here too, you Go could ahead. use, and to be very clear, I mean, I'm a TypeScript guy too, but I've done a lot of ES6 with Angular, probably more than TypeScript at this point, oddly. But you can use either. This isn't one of those things where I think somebody has to go in and get married to one or the other. It's true. And I don't think there's a huge learning curve to go from one to the other, to be honest with you. Yeah, no, I think I, I agree with you, Joe. By the way, for what it's worth, I'll throw this in there. The, the uh, JavaScript code that the transpiler has been producing, the, uh, that the TypeScript transpiler has been producing, is very readable. It is, isn't mm. it? And so, in fact, what I've done, and, and I learned this from Igor, is when I'm debugging, I actually turn off the maps. And I debug in the JavaScript that was generated. And I have no trouble finding where that code was back there in my TypeScript source. Pro tip. Really? Write that down. <laughs> it's a pro tip. Well, let's be fair, too. I think in some cases that works if you keep your code tight still, right? Like if you did, let's say you broke all the rules, and I say these are these are mythical rules, but if you built an application where you've got 10 views, 10 components, uh, and you're putting them all into one file, for example, it may be very difficult to debug that transpiled output, whether you use source maps or not, right? So if you follow good standards and you keep all your things tight and only make them follow a single responsibility, I think it's really easy and reasonable to debug either the TypeScript or the uh, ES5 transpiled code. Yep, no question. So, let's talk about Angular 2 for a minute. Why not? So we had this thing in Angular 1. Let's draw some comparisons because, you know, I'm a dumbo here. I can't figure out what I'm doing, and um, that's me for real. Uh, I'm trying to figure out how do I go from Angular 1 to 2, and I had this thing called a controller and a directive and scope and transclusion and all this stuff. The first thing I was kind of trying to figure out is, hey, they're not mentioning MVC. At least I haven't seen mentions of it. Is that a problem? And I got to tell you, I, the pattern's nice. I love it. It's great. MV star. But doing Angular 2, I feel like I'm kind of there anyway, even though it's not true MVC, meaning I still have models of data, I still have views, my templates, and I still have something that's kind of like a controller with my component. So to me, it's been, it's felt like I'm at home. It hasn't been this massive leap of, wow, I got to learn a new pattern. How do you guys feel about that? I've been doing a lot of uh, consideration of what's underneath the hood. And so for me, I actually find that it's very different. You know, I do see the similar patterns, but I find that it's very different myself. Interesting, because I I had the same uh, reaction that John did. It's almost hard to get away from. Well, I I think of it as MVVM, but you want to call it MVC, that's fine. Because when you have a component, a component by definition is something that has a view and weds it to some kind, controlling, of, some kind of controlling code. And that controlling code is usually producing data that it could be binding to. That's your model. So a component is a view and a controller just almost by definition. And so I'm curious, Joe, about how that didn't come across to you. Well, I also... I'm of the camp that there's no such thing as MVC. There's just whatever one guy believes is MVC and the next guy believes is MVC. Yeah, so if we loosely defined it as the view is HTML and the controller is the stuff that interacts with that HTML and controls that HTML, then, you know, if we could agree to that, then are you cool with the view yeah. C separation? Yeah, yes. yeah, I think the important part here is not so much, I, I agree, Joe, I don't think it matters so much if you called MVC or, or board, you called MVVM, MV star, whatever, right? To me, it's when we try to go to new things, we try to draw similarities based upon our experience in the roads that we've traveled, right? So with that, I was trying to look for anything I could hang on to and say, all right, everything's changed. I need to figure out what isn't different. How would I do what I did before in this new place? And I was very comforted in that. Though at least those concepts to me were, were similar comparisons. So, for example, to me, things I did before in a controller or a directive, 
I now do in a component. Things I used to do in a factory, provider, service, etc., I now do those in just a regular class. And to me, that simplified things too, which was easier. Now I only have two things I got to deal with, really. I got components that are classes, and I've got regular mm-hmm. old classes that are just regular old classes. Instead of 18 different words, I had to remember an Angular one. Right. Pro tip. But things disappeared too, right? So like dollar sign scope, where'd it go? You know, how does, how does data get up to the view? How, how do we do that in Angular 2? Right. Yeah, you're going to have to have, you're going to have to use different patterns. But it's there. And I mean, the, the thing is that, John, as you've been involving your tutorial app to try to explore the primary features that would be of interest to an application developer, you found the things you needed, right? Most of them, right? There's been all the major things have been there. The things I haven't found, and again, it's alpha, are things that I've raised either on GitHub and somebody's already raised them and said, hey, you know, we're needing this. Or they were things that were like, oh, yeah, we need to add that. And literally, like, within a day, the team has been able to put that kind of a thing in there. So to me, it's almost like, uh, you know, caulking the trim around your uh, around your house. It's not like, hey, we forgot a room. It's more just, oh, yeah, forgot that little piece there. Or we need to tie this one up over here. I feel like the state of it now, uh, at what are we at, Alpha 36, is much closer to something that we can actually start seeing what it's going to look like later. And John, if you were to enumerate the the key things that you were trying to to make sure that as an application developer we're, we're in there, what are those key things? My f- top seven, data binding, being able to display data in a list, dealing with like an, uh, ng repeats and things like an Angular 1, which is an ng4 now. Doing master details is the third one, some kind of way to do that and everything involved in it. Number four is all my built-in directives, basically all the things that I need to be able to do inside of an app. Uh, what does Angular give me out of the box to get there? Uh, number five is multiple related components and separation of things into the right places. So making sure I got components and services and bootstrapping and things like that all alone. Uh, number six is routing. I, a single page app isn't much fun with one page. And then number seven is being able to okay. talk to HTTP with asynchronousness. So those seven things in my mind need to be there. And from what I've found, they are there. Yeah, I, I think so. And dependency injection is still there. Yep. Uh, it's actually there, you know, it's dialed up a bit. So, I, you know, when I've reached for something uh, major, I found the answer there. You know, and I, uh, we all come from Angular 1. And when I said, oh, boy, I, you know, I used to do that in Angular 1, I pretty much am at the point where I can say, I know how to do that in Angular 2. That includes the one that if you've been listening to our shows and you've heard me beating the drum about where's the two-way data binding. I think that they've got a syntax there that achieves what we're looking for when we ask for two-way data binding. So we we could call it two-way data binding if you really wanted to squint at it. You know, it's not technically that, but everything you were trying, well, the things you were trying to achieve with two-way data binding, I have found I've been able to achieve with template syntax in Angular 2. All the basic core stuff. So let me take a step back on that. I think there are things in Angular 1, and this is kind of where I'm going with the tutorial that I've been working on that Ward's been um, ch- talking about. Everything you learn in Angular 1, if you watched any uh, of my sessions, read their presentations, or any of the other guys out there doing them, the things you learn are those, the data binding, the HTTP, stuff like that, routing. If you know those things in Angular 1, you can learn them in an hour, and you've got 80% of what you need to build an application. And you can really have a lot of fun. And I feel like that kind of story can be built for Angular 2. And that's kind of what I'm trying to figure out how to, how to articulate that. I don't think this is going to be any harder or any easier, to be fair, than getting into uh, Angular 1, with the only exception of now we have to, the whole JavaScript world has evolved from being uh, script kiddies, as Ward has said in the past, to being more of a real language. You've got, you know, ES6 or TypeScript, and, you know, we've got module loaders and the tooling, and so we've got more things we have to think about that has nothing to do with Angular. It's just the environment has changed. But I think if you just look at Angular 1 versus 2, uh, the concepts, in a lot of ways, some got harder and some got easier. So overall, to me, it's felt very similar. Yeah, I, I agree with you, John. And the thing that's the hardest right now, at least it was the hardest for me, maybe you can chime in, but it's getting in the front door. You know, how do I get my node modules loaded? How do I get my the system JS or whatever I'm using for package loader to come and behave? You know, how do I just get it so the pieces arrive how to imports, how do modules work, you know, and that is largely out of the control of Angular 2 because they've made a commitment to the uh, ES6 style of things. 
Once, yeah, like what, talk about that story work where we we were putting together an Angular two app, and for a week we didn't touch Angular. All we did was try to figure out how do we get System JS in its current beta form, Angular in its current alpha form, and TypeScript one point six in its current beta form to play well together. That was painful, and it was it was hard because you had to know the right. And every time I looked around, somebody had a working example using three alphas ago of one, or I've pinned to this beta of System JS and. And right. I said, well, no, we I went from we went from version 0.16 of system JS to 0.18. And that just shot us. That just was pain. Yes. Well, and if you spent a week trying to get that to work, you probably went through a version or two of alpha. We did. Little things happen. So, for example, and again, this is alpha, right? Little things happen. It was contributing factors. System JS changed the way that they handled the configuration to load the modules. So I had to adjust my system config quite a bit. TypeScript had some things that made it difficult to import things at the time because they're now, the way the import spec's working, I guess, you can put pathing in a different style. So they had to adjust to that. And then on top of that, Angular had something with the old system JS built into the way it did module loading baked into Angular's uh, dev release. So I had to get all three of those people through GitHub to figure out where do I go in this direction because me being me, I'm not willing to pin to an older version. I want the latest. Give me the latest release you've got, and I want to make it work. So before the audience goes running for the hills, we should take a step back and say, look, the story we're telling you here is what it's like to be at the bleeding edge. The yes. fact of the matter is that although we may have suffered to get there, once you learn the right incantations, once you learn how to you know, issue the magic spells, it just it works, right? And they're going to shave off the rough edges. So by the time you, dear audience, are facing this, the way forward should be pretty clear and you won't even know that all of this pain happened. So really what, when we're telling you about our struggles here, we're telling you about what it's like at a point in time as you're trying to approach this thing that's called Angular 2 Alpha. And there's, it, it, we're saying that right now there's pain, but we can see a future, not a distant future, but a future not too far off in which you just follow the cookbook and you're there. Yeah, I agree. And I think I've gotten, at least my personal steps, I've written my own little readmes on how do you get started with this stuff now to get the, I call it the ecosystem. How do you get past the ecosystem so you get to actually working with the code? And I've gotten it down to just a couple of steps now. I mean, it looks easy now. Not knowing it at the time with all the moving parts, that was the hard thing. But now it's easy once I know the right way to go. And I think it's going to get even easier there. This is what it's like to be on the bleeding edge. And, and none of us, at least I'll speak for myself, I'm not building production apps with Angular 2. I'm trying it out. I'm taking it for a test drive to see what it feels like. So one of the things that occurred to me a little bit ago when we were talking about ES6 and TypeScript was ES5. What have you guys done with Angular 2 and ES5? And what are your thoughts and comparisons between that and ES6 slash TypeScript? I have I'm, done very little with ES5 and Angular 2, and that's been intentional. Here. Intentional. I have done very little, but I've done some, perhaps more than others. So I'll tell you what, again, I've got, I haven't gotten much beyond the Hello World example in straight ES5, but let me sort of say this, that they have introduced a DSL. Now, I'm trying to remember what DSL stands for. <laughs> Domain-specific Thank language. Thank you. You know how you throw these terms around and you don't even remember what they stood for. Basically, uh, you dot your way to bliss, okay? Um, so you're going to have a class, the equivalent of a class. So they've written a, a way in which you can author the code so that it you progress by specifying what the components features are, the sort of the equivalent of what you would do in annotations, then specifying what the view will be about in the same way that you would do an annotation in, in ES6 or TypeScript. And then finally, you do the body of what would be your class in ES6. So it, it kind of, it is clearly ES5 JavaScript, plain old JavaScript, but it's structured so that you can communicate all of those things in approximately the same way that you would if you were writing in ES6. And I think that's going to, I think that's going to read well. You know, when I read my sample the, of something that's describing a component this way, it reads well. So I think that they're going to have some bridge sauce in there that's going to make writing it in straight up ES5 okay. Yeah, and they have a blog post out right now where they're talking about how Angular 1 and 2 can actually coexist together. And so the ES, they're doing a lot of things, right, on how you can use ES5 with the Angular 2, how you can live with Angular 1 and Angular 2 in the same app even. And I encourage everybody to go read that blog post the Angular team put out about that. 
Yeah, so so that's if you want to mix Angular 1 and Angular 2. But I was saying, I suppose you wanted, I thought you were asking if I wanted to write Angular 2 in ES5 rather than ES6, can you do it? And the answer is yes, you can. And it's not, you know, in my very limited experience, it actually looks like ES5 that you would feel comfortable writing. So let's talk about some of the stuff that we're actually typing. So it's hard to, like, talk about code over the air, right? But imagine yourselves, close your eyes, unless you're in a car, close your eyes and think about, you know, developing a component right now. A component being, let's say, a list of customers. And you want to have some HTML. You're going to want to have some CSS on there for that component. It's probably going to become some kind of a tag, an element in HTML, maybe called My Customers. And then you're going to need some logic to go with that, some JavaScript. So all of that can be done with components. And the way that they're kind of creating these now in Angular 2, I've noticed, is I create a class called My Customer Component. And I add the properties and things that I want to that. And uh, the way I inject things into there is I actually use the constructor for the class to say, hey, inject my data service or inject the router or whatever the heck I want to inject. And then we use these, um, I always get confused, attributes or annotations. I get confusing too. Decorators. Decorators. Huh. Decorators. It's decorators, but we, uh, you know, that's good. It's Some a of the thing, thing with to, an at sign. Yeah, a thing with an at sign. <laughs> the language here has to be refined, all right? Yes. But, but the most common way of referring to these things is as annotations. So these annotations are important because what they're doing, at least for my stuff, is on top of this class for customers, it's got an at component, which defines something like, hey, what is the HTML tag I'm going to be using for this thing? What's the selector? My customer. And then it's got an at view. And it describes where is the HTML located for this, or is it in line, uh, using things like string interpolation with ES6. Um, what directives am I going to be using on this, and where are my styles? So think of these at things, these decorators on the class, as metadata that describes the component that you're building, uh, which kind of helps it tie it all together. And if you think about the power of that, if you can describe everything your component needs and put it all in one place like that, think of the tooling opportunities, and better yet, Think about this situation. You're writing your code, large application, either by yourself or 10 people with 150 people. And normally, you write your code, you run through CI, and then you still have this queasy feeling of, I need to see it run to make sure it works. Now, with this, you can actually catch some mistakes before you ever go to CI just by looking at your code and having the tooling tell you, hey, you've got the wrong property, you're pointing to the wrong thing, that file doesn't exist, it's the wrong data type. All that kind of stuff jumps right out at you before you ever push, end up into uh, GitHub or your, any of your uh, CI processes. So you were talking about what's kind of exciting about TypeScript to me or even Angular 2, uh, Joe. And for me, that's the power I'm seeing is I've worked on a hmm. lot of really large apps and there's so many things I'm like, yeah, that's going to bite you when you run it. And sometimes I don't even see those things because there's so much code. But these are the kind of things that having metadata and having tooling around this really helps uncover early. So all three of you, right, have a micro, pretty strong Microsoft background, right? Yeah, I think I, I guess I qualify. I probably qualify in that too. But all, aren't all three of you pretty actively still doing Microsoft work? Mm-hmm. So I've, for the last like four or five years, been only in the open space work and haven't really touched .NET in any significant manner in that time. So I'm getting so used to using Sublime to do all my development although I am enjoying Visual Studio Code a little bit. But what do you think it's going to be like for that segment of the front-end world that is just used to using Sublime? They're just open-source devs using Sublime. Is TypeScript going to... Are they not going to see the buy-off in TypeScript? And are they just going to end up just authoring you know, their Angular 2 and ES6 or ES5? I think they're going to start with ES6 and 5, and I've seen people do that. So I've got folks that I um, work with who are dabbling in this arena, and some of them use Brackets, some of them use Sublime, some use WebStorm. And well, let's, let's even talk Vim and Emacs, right? Yeah, and some plenty of them out there. Some of them use Vim like crazy. The funny thing that's been happening is, as we've been doing more and more dabbling, this is all proof of concept stuff they're doing at our particular place, uh, but they're doing more dabbling in TypeScript. The people who are using editors that have TypeScript support are getting uh, the envious looks from the ones who don't. So if you're using Sublime and you don't have a TypeScript plugin in there, you're missing out if you're doing TypeScript. It's not going to be a fun experience. You're not going to gain the value of a lot of these things unless you use an editor that's got that. And I'm willing to bet that all the major editors are going to have full-on TypeScript support soon, and most of the major ones do already. 
Yeah, so, like, like uh, um, Sublime has a. Uh, yep. you, you can wire it in, and WebStorm has very strong TypeScript oh, yeah. support. My colleague, I, well, you know, I'm writing in VS Code, but my colleague here at IdeaBlade, Jay Traband, is is writing in WebStorm, and I kind of like that we're you know approaching the same kind of uh, code base with two different editors, so that we can we can learn the pluses and minuses of those different approaches. And so I I think that that you're going to be able to use the editor of your choice in this world. So let me jump in here real quick. There is actually, if you just Google TypeScript Sublime, there is a plugin. And interestingly enough, if you follow that rabbit trail, it's a repo from the Microsoft account. So they've actually done a really good job of making TypeScript available for additional editors. So, so I wonder what that story is like. Assuming it's, it's or since it's from Microsoft, I would assume it's actually a pretty good story. But it's the same TypeScript service. That's, they're really concerned that when you're running this stuff, and they can make it happen, right? Because it's all JavaScript. They're making sure that everybody gets the same TypeScript service. So if you want to differentiate as an editor, you differentiate in editor features, the yes. kinds of support you, you provide. But nobody's getting a better or worse TypeScript engine under the hood. Everybody gets the same one. This all comes down to there's there's two flavors of TypeScript if you think about what's under there. There's a TypeScript client and there's a TypeScript server. And I'm probably not using the exact right terms here, but... The reason that Visual Studio Code is so good on top of TypeScript is because it's letting you type in the TypeScript client, use the compiler, but it's also using the TypeScript server to actually make sure the tooling is there. And that same TypeScript server can be used in any editor. So you can actually use those, and these plugins can take advantage of them. Or minimally, the plugins can simply just uh, npm install TypeScript globally uh, or locally in their own projects, like for Atom or for Brackets, and take advantage of TSC. So... Uh, I agree with that's, Ward. That's, that. the, that's the compiler. TSC is the compiler, and the TypeScript yep. service is the thing that helps you learn uh, about what's going on in your TypeScript and get information back. And so, if you're, and it's an open API, so if your editor is very good at interacting with other language services, then it should be able to take advantage of the same kinds of uh, hooks that Visual Studio Code is leveraging when it talks to the TypeScript service. And that's part of the design goal. They're dead set on making sure that every tool that's out there that can take advantage of a service has access to it. So I think that, that the story has the potential to be really a good one for whatever you choose. Hmm. Yeah, and I don't think it means you have to go this route, obviously. And I'll bet you there's editors that don't have the support but because uh, there's so many types out there. But if you think about what people who don't use Visual Studio, because in Joe, I, I've been out of, I'm, I'm in Microsoft world, but I haven't done, I don't do Microsoft coding as a daily basis anymore. Uh, I'm doing a lot of open source as well, because uh, that's the demand that I'm seeing. But if you look at the people who don't use Visual Studio, the one thing they do is they know about it, they know it exists, and they hear that it's great because they hear words like IntelliSense and autocomplete and things like that. Other than that, they think of this big tool that, you know, I don't have time for, I'm going to use my Sublime. But wouldn't it be great, they always say, if hey, if I could get just those couple of features in my existing tool. Nobody's going to switch an entire tool to an IDE, maybe some people will, to try out that stuff. I see more frequently is somebody really likes the editor they're in, and they don't have to switch. They can just pull in TypeScript support. They can pull in autocomplete. That's why the package managers for things like Atom and Bracket and WebStorm and VS Code have become popular is... There's all these open source packages and plugins that you can extend to the tool that you want. So you don't have to go find a tool you like. You can stay with the tool you like already and just add in more packages to it. Mm -hmm. I think this is also why one reason why the Google team decided to abandon their own private language, their at script language. It's this powerful. Thank you. Reason. Yeah, yeah. I mean just let's let the rest of the world to handle that one. You know, I'm seeing other frameworks besides Angular that are seem to be getting on the TypeScript bandwagon. I, I believe that Aurelia is trying to get on, is converting their code. I can't, re I don't remember specific, but I thought I remember seeing that they were uh, converting their code to TypeScript as well so that they could take advantage of this whole tool chain. So it's, uh, yeah, I think it's got real potential. So we're getting closer to the end of the show here. I'd like to make sure we've got some, you know, learning lessons for people that we've seen here. I know I've learned a lot over the last couple weeks and months. Lucas, why don't we start with you? What what have you learned about kind of going down this road with ES6 and, uh, and Angular? So I started programming actually with uh, ActionScript 1, and then we went into ActionScript 2 and 3, which was very similar to ES4, uh, which I have forgotten over the last couple of years. But now it's interesting to be kind of back into a, a classical paradigm. So I think you know thinking in terms of, of classes and constructors is a bit new for me again. 
But honestly, the, the biggest thing that I would call out if you're moving in this direction is take a moment to really learn the build system. So for instance, Webpack is still a bit of a mystery to me. Uh, fortunately, I had Scott Moss to hold my hand and uh, help me through that. But like every five minutes uh, when I was getting started, I was like, well, Scott, how do I do this? How do I do this? So again, it's I think it's not so much just syntax, but I think it's kind of the ecosystem, the pomp and uh, ceremony that, that goes around that. And once you kind of get comfortable with the hoops you have to jump through, then it really kind of becomes second nature and you really ramp up your velocity. Even though you're going to take that hit up front, once you understand the tooling, it's it's actually much, much better. That's a great tip. Joe? I would say the main thing that has come out for me has been the inability to appreciate the forest when you spend too much time looking at the trees. I've feel like I've just been so deep trying to look at little tiny pieces of Angular 2 that I haven't really stepped back so that I can get a better grasp of Angular 2 as a whole and appreciate it. I have a great appreciation for Angular 1, love Angular 1, and I'm looking forward to that, taking that opportunity with Angular 2 when I can start building something bigger than just demo projects and starting to really appreciate it for what it is. So I guess if I were to say what the takeaway for me is, is that although as this podcast goes to press, it's nowhere near ready for anybody who doesn't have a lot of time on their hands to do anything with just yet. The prospects for a solid framework are good, and I feel much more comfortable with what's going to happen here in Angular 2 than I did back when we met long ago. I should mention, by the way, that it's very hard right now to... um, get online information about the state of Angular 2. Uh, You wouldn't really want to make much out of the current Angular.io documentation because it's uh, kind of frozen in an old state and is, as I understand it, is being reworked. But so although, you know, you just can't, unless you've got time to burn, you're just not ready to go jump right in the second. But I'm getting much more encouraged about the prospect for something we can feel good about by the end of the year. So I have a few learning lessons that I'd like to to wrap up with. And I guess these are kind of our tips, aren't they, for the show? And the first one is, I kind of want to pile on what Joe said. I feel like there's times when I've been trying to dive deep into Angular 2 features really to understand how does that thing work. And I've really beat my head against the wall. And what's really helped me is to say, stop it. It doesn't matter how that thing deeply works. Maybe it does. But a more important thing is, how does that work in the context of an application? So I kind of changed my direction and said, instead of trying to figure out each individual piece, let me go ahead and build a puzzle. And I've been trying to build sample apps and demo apps. And uh, if you're interested, you can see the evolution of these things up on my GitHub repos at GitHub uh, slash John Papa. They're all various states. And to me, it's been very helpful to see how the different pieces interact with each other and how I use them. Uh, So that's been a lot of fun. And the, r- the real thing kind of surprised me, and it shouldn't, I guess, since I wrote the style guide for Angular 1, is it's been immensely helpful for me to start developing my own conventions for naming of things, uh, both files, folder structures, names of components and classes, and just general conventions on how I write the code. Uh, it's been helpful for me to kind of do that with the Angular 2 stuff to see some kind of patterns that I can pick out for what kind of things I have to do when I'm building these kind of components. Um, it doesn't mean that I'm ready to write a style guide by any means. I'm not. But it's been helpful to at least start to drive these kind of conversations to figure out how do you build a real application uh, with this. And you actually, you know, you have behind the scenes, you have been evolving prototypes for the standards, for the style guides that, that will go with Angular 2. There's no question about it. You've, you've yeah. really been working. You've been every, every step you've been taking, you've been looking at it and saying, OK, so so step back as an application developer. How would I want my projects laid out? How would, what would my folder structure be? What would I name things? Where would they go? You're starting to do all that stuff right now. And I think you're coming out with good answers. Yeah. Well, we'll see how it turns out. I think we should do another follow up one of these, uh, you know, maybe in a month or uh, two months as well and kind of see where things are. The follow cool. follow up. <laughs> so let's move on to picks. So, John, do you want to go first? I have no picks. You can skip me. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, all right. This is a long show, and I hope it was worth it for people. And I have no picks, and I think people will be grateful not to hear them. Awesome, Lucas. So I do have a pick, and that is Pascal uh, Precht has just been killing it on the uh, Angular two content lately. So if you go to blog.thoughttram.io. 
there's a ton of really good uh, Angular 2 content out there. I've really been enjoying it. And um, if you're looking to sink your teeth into something kind of meatier than just a, a five-minute quick start, I think this is the place to go. Cool. I also don't really have any picks, although I will uh, reiterate the announcement about ng-conf. Woohoo! has been out. But tickets are going on sale September 22nd to the winners of the lottery. So the lottery tickets are available now. And even after the 22nd of September, lottery tickets are still valuable because there will be more tickets being disseminated for quite a while after September 22nd, probably for several months. Excellent. This is going to be one of the first big Angular 2 uh, is yeah. out kind of conferences, I would hope and pray. Yeah. I've entered him in the lottery under several different pseudonyms. I'm hoping I get lucky. <laughs> yeah, all duplicate entries are going to be removed. Oh, no. <laughs> but one thing we are doing, uh, along with John's word is, or uh, along with what John said, we're not doing the CFP yet because we want to have very relevant content. So the CFP will actually happen quite a bit later. CFP? Call, call for papers. Pr- pr- papers. Call for proposals. Wow. I thought that was call, call for, for pants, preserves. which is why I did MC Hammer. <laughs> I know. I was <laughs> looking down. And I yes. was like, oh, Lucas, you're still on how you took your pants off at the last NGCon. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right. Well, thanks, everybody, again, for coming. It was a great show. And thanks, everybody, for listening in. We'll see you next week. Peace out. Hosting and bandwidth provided by the Blue Box Group. Check them out at bluebox.net. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit c a c h e f l y dot com to learn more. Do you want to have conversations with the Adventures in Angular crew and their guests? Do you want to support the show? Now you can. Go to adventuresinangular.com slash forum and sign up today. 